going to talk to you about something that is really important to the human condition. It's really <laughs> essential to uh, us as a species, and that is curiosity, the desire to explore. It's, it's the, the desire to know what's around the next corner, and it has driven us as a species out of Africa and to places um, like this, which we just reached recently. So this is Pluto. Um, it's about five billion miles away. And that human curiosity took us out of Africa, allowed us to populate the world, and allowed us to build machines that have taken us to other planets, and now that outermost dwarf planet in our own solar system. And so human exploration is just part of the human species. It's what makes us unique as a species. So I see exploration, I get really excited about it. When they got to, when New Horizons got to Pluto, I got really excited. I went on Twitter, I started reading tweets, I started tweeting, this is fantastic. We've gone all the way across the solar system to see this planet. And then you always see the same thing. Whenever there is exploration, you always see the same kind of responses in social media. Why are they doing this? What's the point? Why are we spending all this money doing this? I don't get it. Why is exploration important? And, and I get it, and it frustrates me. It really drives me nuts. And then I'm like, why, why is it driving me nuts? And I think it's because I understand intrinsically the value of exploration, but it seems like there's something that's being lost. Somehow, some people aren't getting that, that connection. What is happening where we as a species don't recognize the value of exploration for exploration's sake. So the first thing I want to do is address costs. So let's just, just look at costs of exploration. So this is not, there we go. This is, um, this is an aircraft carrier. They're quite expensive to build. We have lots of them. Um, it's about $10 billion to build one aircraft carrier. So the New Horizons mission to Pluto cost this much. Okay, so that little bit of the boat, that's what it cost. And you noticed I didn't color in the airplanes there. You don't get the airplanes. You just get the boat for that. <laughs> so a tiny fraction of the cost of one aircraft carrier. So exploration is high risk, but it's usually low cost as well. And what's the payoff? What is the point of exploration? What do we gain from it? I'm not sure where to point this now. All right. So do you guys know who this is? Christopher Columbus. And what did he bring us? What did he bring us back? What was the point of Christopher Columbus coming to the Americas? His whole goal was to go to the to India to bring back spices. And everybody said, no, too high risk. We're not going to fund it. You're not going to succeed. You're going to you're going to sail off the edge of the planet and you'll be lost and this is too high risk. We're not going to do it. He took off, he found a sponsor, he took off, he found the Americas. And when he found the Americas, he found corn, potato, chocolate. There's a lot of products that were found. Just these three staples alone are worth $100 billion a year in commerce. And these were discovered 500 years ago. So for 500 years, you've had this massive commerce that's been driven just by these three plants that were found in the Americas. And the other thing they found was gold. And it was kind of a big deal. Lots of Inca gold in uh, South America. They don't know how much was found. Um, we, we Brits are quite good um, on boats, and we got quite good at the whole piracy thing. So um, we had a pirate, Sir Francis Drake, and he actually, they calculated, captured about 10% of the gold that was returned from South America to Spain, and it paid off our national debt. So. Was, was the return on investment for Christopher Columbus going to the Americas? It's kind of, it was pretty good. 99 out of 100 times, you're not going to find it. But that's the point of exploration. You don't know what you're going to find until you go do it. And exploration, there's an inquisitiveness about us that, that, that drives exploration. And those types of people can also be really successful in business. Here's just a few examples. Um, this guy is uh, Alan Eustace. He's an executive at Google. He has the world record for the highest freefall dive, 138,000 feet. This is Richard Branson. He's the CEO of Virgin Atlantic, um, the Virgin company. 
He holds the speed record for crossing the Atlantic in a boat, and he tried to circumnavigate the world in a hot air balloon twice. And this is James Cameron. James Cameron, as you know, is a famous director, Avatar, Titanic. He is the first person to do a solo dive at a submersible down to the Mariana Trench, the deepest place on Earth. So it's this exploration can be tied into to successful people, people with drive, people who want to explore the business world as well as their own world. And these people are you know, very rich, very privileged, and you say, well, that's great for these people. They have the power, they have the wealth to do this. What about me? And you can do it. I am a caver. I like to explore caves. What you need to do that is you need a helmet and you need a light. There's lots of other sports that allow you to do it. Or in tearing, you just need a compass. If you want to climb, you need some shoes, you need a harness, you need a rope and a helmet. Small investments that allow you to explore the world. And you get personal rewards from that. You don't have to have a financial reward from doing it. You can get a personal reward. This is uh, me in China. This is a cave we discovered in China. We were exploring for caves in China. We found a river. We didn't know where it came from. It kind of came out the side of a mountain. So we decided to go follow the river and see if there was a cave there. You can't really see. This entrance is about 300 feet high. There's some tiny dots in the distance on this figure, um, on this picture. And those are people in the entrance. Huge entrance. You put this building inside the entrance. We followed the water inside the cave. Now, it was kind of technical. We had to do some technical climbs, put some ropes in. And we followed the air. Caves breathe. Um, when the pressure outside the cave entrance changes, then the pressure inside the cave has to equalize with that. So air will actually blow in and blow out of caves as the atmosphere changes outside when you get weather patterns come through. And you can follow that air. That air is a good indicator where the, where the big cave goes. You can put your hand up and you can feel the air, a gentle breeze. You know you're going in the right direction. When we got into this cave, there was so much air blowing through it. We were talking to each other. It's like, there's got to be a huge cave here. And this thing is blowing so hard, you could fly a kite. So that's what we did. We <laughs> took a kite in and we flew the kite in the air. And we continued to follow it and we discovered this. And this is uh, a room. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, there is a person standing on a rock with their light, and they are shining the light at a person on rope. And that person is about 400 feet off the ground. It was cool when we found it because we couldn't see the ceiling and we couldn't see the walls. It was about 600 feet from wall to wall, and it was about 1,200 feet to the ceiling. It was so big, in fact, it had its own weather system. So we called it Cloud Ladder Hall. You might have, it's been in the, the news, you might have heard about it. Friends of mine went back in with a, a LIDAR, which is a, a, a laser system for measuring um, spaces, and did a LIDAR analysis. Now, Andy and Richard are British, so we use Big Ben from the Houses of Parliament for scale. But you can see this is a digital representation of the structure of that room. And it turned out it's the third biggest room in the world. And it's inside a cave, but it's the third biggest room, period, in the world. It has a 1,200-foot ceiling. So that was my exploration. And the thing about that is that was an experience for me. No one can ever take that away from me. That is something I did, and that is my experience. I got the pleasure of doing that. I got to enjoy that. That belongs to me, and no one can take it away from me. The other thing about being an explorer and being a scientist is I see a lot of caves. I've been in more than a 1,000 caves all over the world. And when I see things, I'm like, what is that? So if you're in a cave and you see some weird goo on the wall, you can say, what is that goo? And you can explore it and see what it is. If you're in Brazil and you're in a cave made out of iron, where caves shouldn't form in iron, and you see a puddle that shouldn't be there because puddles don't form in iron, you can explore it and figure out what it is. My specialty is microbiology, and I try to understand how microorganisms make a living in these environments. So we go into deep caves, we bring organisms out, it's an exploration. We don't know what we're going to find. And one of the organisms we pulled out, we found this, which is a new antibiotic. So you think about exploration, you think about the value of exploration, you don't know what you're going to find. As I said, 99 out of 100 times, it's not going to be anything. But we found a new antibiotic, which is kind of cool. Now, one of the things as a cave explorer, I've been exploring caves for almost 30 years, one of the things that I've noticed is that there's been a change in the demographics. When I started, I was a teenager. I joined the National Society in my early 20s. I just caved and caved and caved. And we were the next wave. There were waves of cave explorers that came through. 
And then I got into my 30s and I looked back for the next wave of cave explorers and I didn't see them. And I continue not to see them. There's no new generation of us. I am a young person in the caving community in the US and I'm in my 40s. And I wonder why is that? Why are we seeing that? And I think a clue came to me when I was hiking with my family. We were in, in Italy and we're hiking the Dolomite Mountains. It's beautiful, it's amazing. And Phil and I, my husband and I, we, we grew up at a time in the 70s where there was no cell phones, there were no microwaves. If your mom needed to call you, she couldn't. She'd have to stand out in the backyard and yell. Um, if you wanted to find out how much corn is traded in the US on a yearly budget, you would have to go to the library and read a book. It's a different time. We entertained ourselves. But we're hiking with the kids, and they've got iPhones and they've got earbuds in. And when we stop, they text their fr friends. When we get to camp at night, they turn on their phone and they watch TV shows on their phone. We're in an environment like this where you can hear the birds squawking as you're so high in the mountains and they're going, boots and cats and boots and cats and boots. <laughs> so the question is, is technology coming between us as a species and our desire to explore. Is this too easy? Is that exploration of our world made too simple by this? So this is a TED talk, so I um, can't just have anecdotes. I've got to have some data. So I know we were warned there would be no graphs, but here you go. <laughs> so this graph is from the, uh, provided to me very kindly, the data from the National Speleological Society, which is the national caving organization in the US. This is 60,000 data points. It would take a while to process. And this is the average age of a member joining our society since it was in, uh, formed in 1941. And the average age takes into account all the age ranges. So when we have a, a higher preponderance of younger people, that age gets suppressed. And it used to be around 24, 25 for many years. When the first full season of color TV came in, oh, I think it's creeping up. Personal computers thing is going up again. Now we're into an average age of 32. <coughs> but you see membership in the society is still cont continuing to climb. The uh, scale bar to the right is uh, thousands of members. Oh, games, video games, right? This is going to have a huge impact. No impact at all. That's pretty good. Then the World Wide Web. And look what happens. People joining flat and off. Smartphones. The number of people joining the society starts to drop. Now we're in the average age of 35. We aren't seeing that young generation joining. Now, this is one society, and there's a whole lot of societal issues that could influence why people join an organization. So I called up some friends at the Explorers Club and asked for their data. Now, their data set is not as large. There are more exclusive clubs, so the no uh, data is a bit noisy. But you can see they've gone from an average of 32 to now an average of 45. Now, they do see a drop in um, the age in the last few years, but they're also seeing that drop in membership. So is this real? Are we seeing an effect of technology on young people? Is it affecting whether they want to go explore their world? Now, what is exploration? When I talk about exploration, don't say you guys all don't have to get on a plane and fly to China. You could. Um, when you take the dog for a walk, tour down a road that you've never been down. You could go eat sushi for the first time. S some people think that the most important thing, we had some good talks about this today, is social justice. That's great. Go do social justice. Don't do social justice with this. Posting a tweet and saying you're angry about something doesn't fix it. We had a great example of somebody changing people's lives by going and doing something. So the most important thing is that you should go explore. And I want to emphasize the go. The hardest part of exploration, even for me, I've been exploring all over the world for a long time, is to actually physically get up and walk out that door. And if you can do that, if you can put this down, I know it's a scary thing, no Facebook for an hour. Go somewhere that doesn't have wireless. Go somewhere that has no cell phone reception. If you can't, make yourself do it. But just go without this. This is becoming a barrier between us and our ability to explore our world. One of the most important things is our curiosity as a species. And we're seeing people lose it because information is so easy at hand, they don't have to make that effort to get up and go outdoors. 
And technology is going to continue to change our lives. And as this new technology comes along, who knows what impact it's going to have. You want to go to Everest right now? You have to climb to the top of Everest. You don't have to do that for too much longer. Thank you.